by way of introduction today to our special guest speaker, and uh, by way of introduction, uh, uh, Bishop Robert is the international uh, overseer, the assistant uh, of youth and discipleship. He's the director of that for the Church of God uh, in the United States. Now, when from the assemblies, we because we're just we always do it just by nation. Uh, over the course of time, as I got to uh, work more with uh, Dr. Sue Shiel, I'm uh, impressed with the work of the Church of God and how they work internationally. And so he's not just a director for the United States, it's the International Ministry of the Church of God, of which there are several churches here, right here on this compound and here in Kuwait. And uh, we've been blessed. We've had uh, uh, Dr. Uh, um, Doug Small was here a few months ago. You remember that. And uh, then their general overseer, or, or bishop, I think you call it, uh, Reverend Hill. I'm not sure what the titles are. He was here. And so we've been blessed. He's coming again in a few months. And so we just want to say, as a Lighthouse Church, it's a privilege of ours to work together with the Church of God as we work with many other churches, but in particular with Church of God and what you have been doing uh, here in this region for many years. So God richly bless you. <clears throat> and um, uh, Robert Bailey is in charge of the youth and it's discipleship, and there's always uh, a work of the enemy working against the next generation. So in many ways, people who are working with children and youth are on the front lines of the spiritual warfare because the enemy is always attacking the young people. And uh, just as we watched last night, the excitement among the young people as our brother uh, was ministering the Word of God and as I was talking to some of the young people afterwards, their excitement that they received and the things that God spoke into their hearts through our brother, they were encouraged and blessed. And we thank God uh, for people like yourselves, uh, Pastor, who are investing into the next generation. And so it's our privilege to have him here. He's sharing here and then in the 3.30 service as well. Uh, I don't need to say any much more, but let us please give a nice Kuwait welcome to Bishop Robert Bailey. Welcome here. Welcome. Thank you so much. Would you give your pastor a hand of appreciation? Well, do you love and appreciate Pastor Gerald? I know that you do. What an incredible privilege and honor it is to be able to be here in the house of the Lord today. What God is doing in, in Kuwait, I've been so impressed over the last few days to see what God is doing in, in, uh, in, in our midst. Praise God for his touch. Amen. Amen. Um, I do greet you on behalf of the leadership of the Church of God. Uh, Dr. Hill has been here and is looking forward to coming back to be with you. We, we do represent 185 different countries. There's a few countries that we don't have a presence in, but we are working in the name of Jesus to get there as well. Uh, somewhere between seven and a half to 7.6 million people uh, are within our denomination of the Church of God. But we are a part of mu something much larger called the Kingdom of God. And as the Kingdom of God, you are my brother, you are my sister, and we are here in His presence today. Somebody say amen. 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 God is so good. It is such a privilege to be able to not only be here worshiping with you, but the opportunity to share uh, from the Word of God is something that I, I, I hold uh, so dear. Thank you for sharing your pulpit with me and your hospitality that you've shown over the last few days. If you're hungry for the Word of God, would you say amen? amen? I wonder today if we could stand to our feet as we look to the Word of God in Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. The, the message that God has laid on my heart for today is a message that I entitled Power and Glory. Would you say that with me? Power and Glory. Uh, if there was a subtitle to the message, I would subtitle it and I would call it Giving Up the Glory to Receive the Power. Acts chapter 3, beginning with verse number 1, the Bible says this, Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fasting his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And the lame man gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. And Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Verse 7 says, And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. 
and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength, and he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. Shall we lift our hands today and pray unto the Lord? Heavenly Father, we love you today. God, we are so grateful for your word. Your word says of itself, it will never return void. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the people of God. And Father, thank you for the presence of your spirit that's in this place. We ask God for your anointing to break yokes of bondage. God, it's your anointing that, that breaks the yoke. And we give you thanks and praise. Allow me, God, to be hidden behind the cross and not be lifted up, but only let Jesus be lifted up in this place. So when the Son of Man is lifted up, that's when men and women are drawn to you. God, our heart's cry is that men and women and young people all over this world would be drawn to your side. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said, amen. amen. Shake someone's hand as you're being seated today. According to our text, and you may be seated, according to our text from Acts chapter 3, the Bible tells us that the ninth hour of the day, or what we would know as, as around 3 p.m. in the afternoon, Peter and John are walking toward the entrance of the temple through the gate called Beautiful, a gate that would open up into the court of, of women from the outer court of the Gentiles. And on the way to the temple, passing through this gate called Beautiful, this gate that was inlaid with, with precious gold, inlaid with, with precious stones, as they are standing at the entrance to the, to the side of the, the temple courts, they came across a man who had been crippled since birth. A man that was so lame that he could not even hobble along with the aid of a crutch and said he had to be carried everywhere that he went. He was absolutely relegated to a life dependent upon the charity of others. Not only was he a beggar, but he, he couldn't even do that by himself. He needed help to be picked up and carried every day and laid at the temple gate. Total dependence, begging from people going in to pray. It's interesting to me, Pastor, that he wasn't allowed to go inside the temple to pray. He had to stay outside because he was crippled, you see. Uh, because of religious people's pride, they, uh, they said he was blemished. You're not worthy to come inside and, and worship with us. The, the, the religious people of the day uh, said you're unfit to come in and, and be in the house of God. So the beggar sat on the steps as close as he could and pleaded with people for alms for coins, for change, for, for money, something to, to help the beggar would yell out, alms. That was his job. That's what he did to have his needs met. He cried for alms. He, he had no job. He had, he had no talents that we know of, no abilities that we know of, no, uh, no uh, ability to make ends meet. So he simply survived by the generosity of strangers, and every day was the same as the day before. He would wake up, be carried to the temple gate, be laid down, spend the day crying and begging for assistance. The day would end. He would be picked up and carried back home. And on this day, I'm sure it was the same as, as every other day, he cried out alms to the people that passed by, and I'm sure that some gave. I'm sure that some ignored him and pretended that he wasn't even there. Maybe they'd grown used to his cries and, and didn't even bother them. I imagine that some parents uh, took this as a teachable moment to their kids and, and said, see, kids, that's, that's what happens when you sin. Everything was like every other day until Peter and John came upon the scene. Somebody say amen. Because when Peter and John approached where this man was sitting, the crippled man that he had always done cried out alms, but instead of hearing money jingle jangle into his cup, Peter and John heard the beggar begging for help, and he said, as he stopped, Peter said, look on us. This tells me a couple of things this morning, this afternoon. It tells me that this man's head was bowed down. 
It tells me that he most likely was very ashamed at who he was and what he was doing. He kept his head hung down low, humiliated and degraded. And it reminds me of so many people that are outside of the household of faith, humiliated, degraded by the lifestyle that they're living, ashamed, wishing that something was different. But Peter looked at him and said, look at us. Did you catch that today? Peter actually gave him permission to raise his head up, raise himself up from who he was, from where he was from, and look at them. And the Bible says he looked up expecting to receive something from them. And then Peter gave those words that are probably familiar in this house. He said, maybe you could even say it with me, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. The Bible says that Peter took hold of that man's right hand and lifted him up. And in that moment, somebody say that moment. In that moment, the Bible says strength came into that man's feet and ankle bones for the first time in his life. And he leapt up and began to jump and dance around in front of the hundreds of Jews that were coming into the temple for prayer. He praised God for the power that had been displayed. Church, I'm talking this morning about the power of God. I don't know about you, but I long to see God's power moving in our midst. Does anybody else hungry for God's power today? You know, we, we've sung songs about God's power. I'm ready to experience God's power. Everything that we are as a church around the world and everything that we're desiring God to do with us and for us and through us, everything and anything will only be done by God's power being poured out. That's why Zechariah 4, 6 says it's not by might, it's, it's not by strength, it's by my spirit, says the Lord. We can do nothing without God pouring out his power. Without the power of God, we are helpless. We can't see one person set free without his power. We won't see one person saved without his power. We won't see one person delivered without his power. We're just not smart enough. We're just not strong enough. We just don't have it within ourselves. But Lighthouse Church, when the power of God is manifested in our lives, there's no task that we cannot accomplish through him. Does anybody agree with that today? With the power of God manifested in our life, every devil in hell can camp out in our backyard and shoot whatever fiery dart they want to shoot at us, but their plan will not work. It'll backfire in their face every time. When the Spirit of God is manifested in our life, then no weapon formed against you is going to prosper. I wish somebody would give God a hand clap of praise in this place. I'm talking about the power of God. I love how Zechariah writes this in Zechariah chapter 3, verse 7, as he's quoting God. He says, thus says the Lord of hosts, if you walk in my way and if you keep my command, then you shall also judge my house and likewise have charge of my courts. And he says this, I will give you places to walk among those who stand there. Did you hear what he said? He said, I'll give you places to walk among those who stand there. What God is saying is that these forces that are dug in and ready to fight against you, these forces that are entrenched and have you in their crosshairs, these forces that have been there before you got here, he said, I'll give you power and you will walk among them. They will not be able to touch you. I've just stopped by this day to remind somebody that the devil does not have you surrounded. He does not have you hedged in. He, he does not have you in a trap. Understand that you are the head and not the tail. You are the lender and not the borrower. God is using you to make a difference in this world. Hallelujah. But child of God, I must remind you today, do you know where your strength comes from? Do you know where your power comes from? I want to give you a hint. It's not in your wisdom. 
It's not in your strength. It's not in your insight. It's not in your sense of judgment. Listen, praise God for all of those things, but your power does not come from within you. It doesn't come from your strength. It doesn't come from your enormous brain. It doesn't come from your energetic outlook or how charismatic you are. Your strength and your power come only from the Lord of hosts. Without him, we cannot do it. But the Bible says, I love 2 Chronicles 16, 9. It says, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. Reason why? To show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal to him. That means that God is looking for people just like you whose heart is loyal to him, and when he finds you, he's going to show himself strong on your behalf. I want God to show himself strong on my behalf. Do you? I want to invoke an environment that, that God will move and God's power will flow. If we go back to our text in Acts chapter 3, I see some very basic principles in this story that we want to want to recognize if we have a desire to see God's power. If you're ready for it, say yes. The first point that I see in our text is that God's power flows where he is. Somebody say where he is. God's power flows where he is. That sounds so simple, so, sounds so obvious. God's power flows where he is. But understand from the perspective of this lame man, this lame man had been outside of the temple for years. Acts chapter 4 verse 22 said he was over 40 years of age. And this temple, which represented the very house of God, the essence of God's presence, uh, but religion had forced him to stay outside of the presence of God. Are you hearing me today? You see, God was there, uh, but God's tangible presence was behind the veil. God was there, but to the downcast and to the forsaken, to, to the downtrodden, he was not approachable. But then God, in miraculous and marvelous plan of salvation that he laid out, God became approachable. Hallelujah, God is approachable today. And when Jesus declared those words, those last triumphant words from the cross, when he said, it is Finish the Bible says the veil that separated man from God was torn in two from the top to the bottom. This veil that for centuries had barred man's presence from being with God was torn in two. What does that signify? Well, we usually hear it preached that, that now mankind can enter the holy of holies. I remember a song song when I was a boy that says, now I can go. Have you heard that? Into the holy of holies. I can kneel and make my petitions known. I, I love that song. I've sung that song. But that's only half of the story. You see, it, it doesn't just signify that now mankind can go behind the veil, but now it means that God has come out and he lives in his new dwelling place. He dwells in the lives of those who love him. And we are the vessels of God. We are the house of God. And I can just imagine when that veil was torn in two, all the religious people got so nervous because now everything has changed. And the, the, there may have been someone that said, well, all we have to do is just tack it back together. We just, we just sew it back together and it'll be fine. Uh, they're, they're interfering with our safe little religious lifestyle. But friends, when the veil was torn away, God was making his, his declaration of where he intended to reside. He said, I'll no longer be behind a veil. I'll no longer be inside some, some holy box. He said, I'm making a declaration that I intend to reside in my people. And this crippled beggar who lived outside of the presence of God, he was approached by the very presence of God in the form of a man named Peter and a man named John. And this lame man, as he sat at the gates of the temple all of his life, now is experiencing the real power of God's presence because God's presence flows where he is. And it's not flowing out of the doors of the temple, but rather it's walking up the stairs, Peter and John. And this lame man was healed because God's power flows where he is. See, Mary and Martha, the friends of Jesus, the sisters of Lazarus, they, they understood 
the power of God was in the presence of God. And when their brother Lazarus was dying, they didn't call for a doctor. They called for Jesus. They said, Jesus, your friend, our brother, is sick, but if you'll come, he's going to be okay. They knew that if he was present, if, if God's presence was there, that everything was going to be okay. But the Bible says that Jesus arrived late. That's funny to me because he's an on-time God. He's never going to be late. But according to their perspective, Jesus showed up late. And by the time he got there, Lazarus was already dead. And do you remember what Martha said? Do you remember what she said? She said, Jesus, if, if you only had, had been here, then my brother would have been okay. If you had only been here, it would have been fine. She knew that where Jesus was, there was power. But her problem was that she only saw Jesus as the God of her yesterday. Oh, only if, if only you had been here in the past, everything would have been okay. And Jesus lovingly looked at Martha and, and, and said, Your brother will live again. And you know what she said? She said, yes, I, I have full faith. I know he'll live again one day in the resurrection. You see, to her, Jesus was the God of yesterday. And Jesus was the God of the future. Uh, but, but she had a hard time understanding that he was not just the God of the past and not just the God of the future. He was the God when Jesus looked at her and said, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and life. If you believe in me, though you were dead, yet you shall live. Friends, he's the God of today. Somebody give God praise for Jesus, the God of today. He has all the power that you need today, yesterday, today, forever. He is the same. And God's power flows where he is. And he's not bound by time or space or matter. And he's the same God here in Kuwait as he is in my home in Cleveland, Tennessee. He is the same God. The same God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's the same God for me and my family and you and your family. He is the God that never changes. And He lives within us. That's why Paul told the Colossian church in Colossians 1.27, the church of Colossians, he said, Christ in you, the hope of glory. What that means is that God's power is not relegated just to when we come here to this wonderful facility that has been provided to us by His kingdom, but He's with you when you go to work. And he, he's with you when you go to school. He's with you when you come in and when you go out. He's with you at home. He's with you in the marketplace. He's with you wherever you go. God's power flows because he lives in you. The second point today is that God's power not only flows where he is, but God's power flows where there is expectancy. Our text in verse 4 says that, that Peter fasting his eyes upon him with John said, Look on us, and this crippled man gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something from them. That word expectancy, it means to wait for something in suspense. There, there was something awesome about these two men who'd bother to stop and talk with him. There was something about them that made him wait in suspense. He was expecting something good, but he was expecting something. Do you understand that today? That, that word expectancy, I understand it means that, that, that God is wanting to do exceeding abundantly above all we could ever ask or even think. The problem is so many people come to church not expecting God to do anything at all. All over the world they come to church just for another, another service. Sing a song that makes me feel good. Shake my hand, hug my neck, tell me it's going to be okay. Preacher, preach something that's going to make me feel good. Maybe I'll throw a, a something in the, in the offering plate. Maybe I won't. But I'm probably not going to get a whole lot out of this. If everything goes well, we'll make it to lunch in time to... 
get back home in time. That's what happens so many times. But what I, what I want to tell you is that we have to get hungry for more of God than just another service, just another time to sing a song and hear a message that makes us feel good. We have to come in longing to hear the voice of God, longing to hear God speak. Somebody say amen. amen. There is nothing sadder than going to church unexpected. If it gets to the stage that we as Pentecostals come to church not expecting anything, then we will be, of all men, most miserable. The thing that I've discovered in, in my lifetime is whether you come in expectant or unexpectant, you're absolutely right. If, if you come in saying, probably nothing's going to happen today, you know what? Probably nothing's going to happen today. But if you come in saying, oh, I can't wait to get into the house of God because I believe that something incredible is going to happen in this place. I believe that we're going to see the presence of God move. I believe we're going to worship God in spirit and in truth. I believe that miracles are going to happen. I believe that unity is going to happen. I believe in the church. I believe that something is going to happen when we come in expected into the presence of God, when we come in with expectation expectancy and anticipation, whether in our private devotional or in a corporate worship setting, God will show up, but we must come to God with expectancy. Say, well, preacher, how do you know that? I know that because the Bible says this, they that come to God must believe that he is, and he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. We serve a God that's a rewarder. Can anybody testify that God is a rewarder of he is a rewarder. He's a giver. He knows how to give good gifts. Just wonder today, has there any, been anybody here that showed up with expectancy what God is going to do, that God is going to do something new in your life, that God will do something exciting in your life, that God is going to do something fresh in your life. I declare if you have come with that kind of attitude that you won't leave here like you came in Jesus' name. I want to talk to you about expectancy. You see, the Bible says in 1 Timothy 2.8, God's voice piece, Paul, is saying, I desire that men would pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. How did he say? Without wrath and without doubting. That we would come in knowing that God is going to do something with expectant hearts. Hebrews 11.6, he says, without faith. It's impossible to please him. We, we have reason to come to God with expectancy because God always answers prayer. Has your prayers ever been answered before? Raise your hand if God has answered prayer. I, I want to be bold and I want to say that God answers every prayer. Every prayer I've ever prayed, he's answered. I, I learned this from Bill Hybels. Bill, Bill said every prayer I've ever prayed has been answered. Sometimes God answers yes. And sometimes God answers no, and sometimes God answers later. But can you agree with me that God's ways are higher than our ways? God knows what we have need of. God has the ability to give to us what we need. But God always answers prayers. Sometimes the answer is no, but do we still trust him in spite that we didn't get our way? Sometimes he answers with a different provision than what I thought I needed. That's when we have to recognize the lordship of, of Jesus Christ. You see, I, I, I'm the proud parent of four children. I always wanted two children. My wife wanted four. So we compromised. I had four. But when my children were little, and they would ask me as their father for the things that they wanted. They thought what they wanted was what they needed. Are there any parents here that know what I'm talking about? And they, they said, we, we want this, but what, what we need this. We, but what they really didn't know was what they really needed. But that's when trust had to come in that me as their father who wanted to bless them and, and serve them and see that they, their needs are met, sometimes I had to, to take that request and, and process it with a little bit more experience than what they had and tell them, no, you can't have two pieces of cake. But daddy, we need two pieces of cake. In their mind, they needed it. No, they didn't need it. They wanted it. 
How many times do we talk to our, our Heavenly Father and tell Him the things that we think we need, but it's not what we actually need, it's what we want. What we have to do is trust in the Lordship and the, and the Heavenly Father knowing what we actually need, recognizing His Lordship, that He is Lord, He is the leader of our life. And I, I wonder when we sing all to Jesus, I surrender, do we really mean what we are saying, our thoughts our ways, our will, we have to recognize that his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. I, I'm, I'm closing today, but before I do, I, I want to get to the third point. God's power flows where he is. God's power flows where there's expectancy, and God's power flows where he alone receives the glory. God's power flows where he receives the Acts chapter 3, verse 8. The Bible says that he, this, this lame man leaping up, stood and walked and entered into the temple, walking and leaping and, and praising God. And the Bible says all of the people saw him walking and praising God. Understand that when God moved on this lame man through the prayers of Peter and, and John in Acts 3, he was healed but he was healed in order that his own great name might be honored. Peter and John could rightly claim the authority in the name of Jesus because the moment was going to bring glory to God. God moves where he receives the glory. The Old Testament illustration of this, the Bible says that God opposed Saul, but he exalted David. Why is that? And I tell you the answer is because Saul sought to glorify himself. Saul, Saul wanted to be lifted up and, and, and exalted himself, but David always sought to honor God. Did that mean that David was, was perfect? The Bible says that he was a man after God's own heart. Was he perfect? No, he wasn't perfect, but when he failed, he was always quick to confess and repent, but at the end of the day, he said, God, I want you to be lifted up. As we read the beautiful Psalms, he's not lifting himself up. He's not saying, how great am I? He's saying, how great our God is. In the New Testament, the Acts chapter 9, we read the seven sons of Sceva. And, and, and these men had the audacity to try to invoke the name of God for themselves, the name of Jesus, to gain glory for themselves. I, I won't take the time to go into the whole story. If you want to read it later, go to Acts chapter 19. But to say they encounter with a demon-possessed man went poorly. If you ever leave a fight and you're beaten up and bloody and naked, you lost the fight. <laughs> but they wanted to invoke the name of Jesus for their own glory's sake. I want to tell you that God's power flows where he receives the glory. Would you stand to your feet with me today? God's power flows where he receives the glory. Back in 1858, there was an incredible revival that shook the nation of Wales. A revival that would spread from Wales and, and, and went from coast to coast. But one of the men that God used so miraculously was a man by the name of David Morgan. And an old minister wrote a journal about an encounter with this one night with, with this brother Morgan. And in this journal of this old minister, written in the first person narrative, he writes this. He says, the evening was awesome. And so near was the revivalist to his God that his face shone like that of an angel so that none could gaze steadfastly at him. And many of his hearers swooned. On the way home, I dared not break the silence for miles. Towards midnight, the old minister writes, I ventured to say, didn't we have blessed meetings Brother Morgan, yes, he replied. And then after a pause, he added, the Lord would give us great things if only he could trust us. 
If only he could trust us not to steal the glory for ourselves. And the midnight air rang with the sound of his cry at the top of his voice, saying, Not unto us, O Lord, but to thy name give glory. Can I tell you the miracles that we are believing God for? And if you have a need, would you slip up your hand? Sure, all over the house we have needs. We have things that we're believing in and trusting God to do something with them. But can I tell you that with every miracle, God's power will flow where he is. And God's power will flow where there's expectancy. But God's power, his true power, will only flow where he receives the glory. Can I tell you that we must jealously guard to ensure that everything that we do is genuinely for his glory. I, I, I titled the message Power and Glory and I, I said if we wanted to subtitle it, we could subtitle it, Giving Up the Power to Receive the Glory. The other subtitle could have been giving up the glory to receive the power. You understand the difference? God has no problem sharing his power with his people. We see it throughout the Bible. From the Old Testament to the New, we see God sharing his power with his people. But God will never share his glory. And if you want to operate in the power of God, if you want to see God do miracles, He alone must receive the glory. Because the moment that you take the glory, you give up the power. The moment that you take the glory, you lose the genuine power of God. Oh, and so what happens is we, we, we got so used to it, we begin to, it doesn't have to be authentic. We can just fake it. We, we can just do it by rote. We can just do it because we're so used to it. But at some point, we lost the authenticity. We lost the power. Or church, what we can do is we can say, God, to your name be glory and honor. To your name be lifted up. And when we glorify God with everything that we do, I tell you in Jesus' name, God's power will flow through his church. God's power will flow in miracles and signs and wonders will follow the believers. All over this house, I want you to lift up your hands in Jesus' name. Can I tell you today that whatever you have need of, our God's power flows where he is, and he is in this place because you are here. And there is something that happens when we come together with people of like faith. I can't tell you that I understand it, but I only know what the Bible says, which is two are stronger than one, because if one falls, the other lifts him up again. I can't say that I understand it, but the Bible says that a threefold cord is not easily broken. There is power when we are unified and together. I wonder today, could we close this time of prayer by coming down to the front and just linking our hearts together with those of like faith as a family? Can we pray and ask God to move in our hearts and move in our lives and move in our family and move in this nation? Can I ask you to come forward for prayer? Whatever you have need of today, come forward. Musicians, if you could play, let's lead, let's lead us in worship. Would you come? Great is our God. Come with your hands raised just in surrender. Sing with me how great is our God. Oh, we we'll see how great. Lord, we love you today, God. How great is our God. Would you just take a moment and worship him with everything that you have? How great. 
sing with me how great is our God. And oh, we see how great, how great is our God. Come on, let's worship him again. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And oh, see how great, how great is our God. How great. today and you have a special need, would you just slip up your hand today? Say, I have needs that only God can, can fill. Thank you, Jesus. He sees your heart. He sees your hand from the front to the back. And I'll say early what I said again. He, he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all we could ask or, or even think. Would you do something for me? Would you, as a point of contact and, and so that it's just confirmed that none of us are here by ourselves, would you reach out and just touch the hand or the shoulder of the person you're standing beside and just begin to pray for them? God, I bless your holy name. God, you know the needs of your people. Your word declares you know our needs before we even ask it. And God, I pray for miracles today. I, I pray that every need is met in the name of Jesus, God, for your name's sake. God, so that your name is made great, so that your name is made famous. God, let man's name decrease and let the name of Jehovah be great. God, for, for those who need salvation in their home, would you slip up here if there's salvation that's needed in your home? God, we are believing for miracles of salvation. God, if, 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 you, if you could pour out your spirit before, you can do it again because you're not bound by anything. If there's a, a need of healing that you have in this house, would you slip up your hand if there's healing that you need in your body? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The Bible says that by his stripes we were healed. And just like this lame man, maybe your need is different than his, but like him, you are dependent upon God to do what only God can do. Father, in Jesus' name, we pray healing. God, from the top of heads to the bottom of feet, God, from the inside to the outside, we pray for healing, not so that our name is lifted up, but God, so that your name is lifted. If you have need in your family, would you lift up your hand today? God, bless families. God, I pray for husbands and wives. I, I pray for sons and daughters. I pray for parents and children. I, I pray the hearts of fathers will go to their children, the hearts of children back to their fathers. In Jesus' name, we pray blessings on families. If you're here and you have a need in your finances, we lift up your hand today. If you have a need in your finances, we serve a God who owns the cattle on a thousand hill. Everything is his. The word of God says the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. And Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that you would meet temporal needs in this place. God, I pray that you would meet the needs of your people today. If there's an unspoken request that you have that you're believing that only God can fix it, would you lift up your hand today? Father, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, from the front to the back, God, we pray for miracles, signs, and wonders, God, that you would do and you would accomplish. Your power flows where you are. Your power flows where there's expectancy. And God, you've been so good to us. And our faith is in you and you alone. And God, you receive the glory. You move where you alone are glorified. So be glorified. In Jesus' name.